Well, brethren, as we have had a wonderful feast and spiritual meat, we now need to move forward to the kingdom of God. And we need to do, move forward to do the work of God and prepare for the kingdom of God more powerfully and more effectively and more heartfeltly than ever. And I'm sure all of us feel that way. There are a lot of things a successful uh, person should uh, have. A lot of things for a successful person, especially a successful Christian. You should have friends. You should have family. You should have good personality. You should have health. Health is very important. You should have enough money. You don't need to be rich, but you should have enough money in our consumer-driven society. And you should have a satisfying job. Mr. Armstrong used to quote Albert Hubbard, Hubbard, who said, get your happiness out of your work. But there's one thing that's more important than all of that. One thing is vital, and that is character. I used to teach the advanced public speaking and homiletics class for years in Ambassador College where we would train the advanced students, the advanced men to become ministers. And I started out the lecture at the first of each year saying, what is the most important single quality for a minister? Is it technical Bible knowledge? Is it having a wonderful personality? Is it having a deep, rich voice? Is it have a, having a good appearance? Other things, no, not one of those things is the most important. The most important single quality is character, to have a godly character. Perhaps you've heard the old saying, which the Protestants use themselves, although they don't fully understand it, but it has been applied to many different ministers and priests and outside professing Christian groups and should be and is applied to us as well. What you are screams at me so loudly I cannot hear what you are saying. If a minister is, you know, a thief, if a minister is an adulterer, if a minister is, and you name it, greatly lacking in character, then you cannot respect him to the same degree you would if he did not practice what he preached. That's very important. And brethren, every single one of you and every one of you ladies and every one of you younger people here are training to be ministers, whether you think of it that way or not, it is the truth. We are going to be kings and priests. Priests were ministers. <laughs> and we're going to be kings and also combine the job of being pre-teachers, priests, Levites, and priests. Not just the younger Levites, but by the time they reached age 30, the Levites were used as priests, many of them. And you know that how important that is. And so we're all training for that very kind of job. Not all of us in this life, but in tomorrow's world. We will be ministers. We will be priests. And so the most important single thing we need above everything else is character. So although good breeding, having a good family and background, good environment, good training and circumstances all play a part, in the end it is you who decide what kind of character you are. Most of you read the stories of Abraham Lincoln's childhood, how he had an alcoholic father, and how he didn't really have much of a father, how he had a later a stepmother, and how he had lots of problems growing up. How he had to develop his understanding and technical knowledge by reading books and borrowing books and walking miles to get a book and reading them by the light of a fireplace. And yet our young people today growing up in a consumer-driven and a hedonistic society, fun, 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 and surrounded by television and the internet, surrounded by all kinds of books, but they're not good readers. Their reading is going down. Many of them could not begin to compare with Abraham Lincoln and his knowledge of great literature and even knowledge of the Bible, although God did not call him to the truth. He had a very poor background, very poor environment as a whole, but he became one of the greatest presidents, perhaps the greatest president of the United States. Sir Winston Churchill had parents who were involved in politics and in society. His mother, the American Jenny Jerome, who married his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, was totally involved in society. And she slept around, frankly. She was a very frivolous person who went to parties and high society things over and over. They turned him over to a nursemaid whom he called Womb, who virtually reared him, later sent him to boys' schools where he got beat so badly he, bleed, he bled, beat by these cruel headmasters they sometimes had, his father totally neglected him, only had one talk, one talk that lasted more than maybe five or ten minutes, one talk with him that lasted more than that in his entire life, according to his own account. 
And that was one time when he was a teenager, an older teenager, and he saw Churchill playing with this great big panoply of uh, toy soldiers and had them all lined up with play horses and toy horses and all this and having a mock battle. He said, would you like to go to the military? He was disgusted with his son because his son was not making real good grades. Churchill felt totally neglected by his father and mother, and yet he became the man of the century, according to many accounts. Now, recently, Time magazine is called Einstein, the man of the century, but for years they thought Churchill was. Well, you could name any one of five, five or ten people man of the century, but Churchill was certainly one of them, one of the greatest leaders of modern human history. He rose above his environment, and he went all out. And he was the one that John F. Kennedy said, mobilize the English language and send it into battle. We shall not fail. We shall not waver. We shall go on and so on. He kept telling the English people in the time of darkness and the battle of Britain, don't give up. Never, 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 never turn aside and quit, he told them. And he set that example. And he thought big. But he trained himself. He used his own will to do that. And he didn't have God's spirit. Abraham Lincoln did not have God's spirit. So all the good breeding and environment, all things are important. And in the end, it is you who decide what kind of character you're going to be. And godly character cannot be instantly created by fiat. You can't just, or God can't just say, I will give you character. That wouldn't be character. He would make you automatons, if you see what I mean. If he made everybody do this, then we would be all walking around and like robots, and God would ro program us like a computer to do certain things. He wants spirit personalities like him who come right out from him and have his very nature, his very character, because through a lifetime of suffering, of learning, of overcoming, of growing, they have learned to appreciate the right character. They have learned to appreciate the right way. And they voluntarily, as a human being with free moral agency made in the image of God, decide at some point, certainly through God's help, God has to call them in the first place, usually knock them down through some kind of circumstance to humble them, to wake them up. But then they have to decide, will they really yield to God or will they continue to go on their own way? Will they continue to desire to have fun more than God? Or will they desire to think about the self and be all puffed up, filled with themselves? Here's what I think, here's what I think, and so on, like people sometimes do. And they're filled with self-will and vanity. Or will they humble themselves and say, I am nothing, less than nothing, and vanity, and I want to be like God, and I really do want God to teach me. I really do want God to fashion and mold me. I really do want God to change me and make me like he is and then yield to go through that process of growing and overcoming. That's the kind of character God wants in his kingdom. And this development of character cannot be created all at once. It must be done by suffering, by growing, by overcoming over a period of time. Character is that moral or spiritual force within which impels one to integrity. That's a very important concept. Character is that moral or spiritual force within which impels one to integrity. It is exercising the power of the Holy Spirit so that you resist the wrong and do the right with the help of God's Holy Spirit, obviously, because you cannot do it on your own. Back in Matthew chapter 26, we learned some lessons you'd like to turn there, here is the one who became the chief apostle over the Jewish apostles at the beginning. And the Bible describes this, a story most of you are familiar with, so I don't read every word here necessarily. But in Matthew chapter 26, after giving the New Testament Passover of the bread and the wine, verse 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So here is Christ and the apostles after that last Passover. Then Jesus said, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So he showed from this Old Testament prophecy, of course, that the sheep would be scattered. But after I have ra been raised, he meant raised from the dead, of course, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. 
Nothing could turn me aside, Peter said. Well, you know, the story is about Peter. He was called the big fisherman, and a lot of things indicate he probably was a good-sized man, and he probably had a lot of enthusiasm. He probably had a lot of drive, and that part is good, but he was self-willed many times, sometimes spoke up presumptuously. Remember that John's account is that when they came to the empty tomb, why they were starting out together, but John outran Peter, and then he stood outside the tomb, but then Peter, when he got to the tomb, he just came right on in because he had that confidence, you know, that human confidence. And then John came in also and saw the wrapped headpiece that Christ, where Christ had laid. It was neatly folded and so on. Many times it shows Peter was like that. At that last time after Christ's resurrection, why Jesus was standing on the seashore and the apostles were out there fishing. Peter said, I go a-fishing. And the other apostles said, we go too. Now that meant more, I think, than many of us realized because they had been what before? Professional fishermen. Peter, without realizing, was starting to get them back to their old profession. They thought Christ is gone. The thing may be over. What's going on? And he started to go fishing again. That's why Christ then said, do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep. And so on. But when Christ was standing on the seashore and he says, do you have any fish? They'd fished all night. And he yelled out to them apparently across the water. They must have been 50 or 75 yards out there. But they said, no, we haven't caught a thing. And then he said, cast the net on the other side. Well, even though they'd cast all over before, it said they did that. And suddenly the, the net was filled, absolutely filled with fish. And John, who was more humble and more perceptive, said, it's the Lord because they didn't know who this was, see. He looked a little different. It's the Lord. John was humble and perceptive. And then when Peter saw his dear friend John say, it's the Lord, oh, wow, that's right. Then Peter takes the lead, jumps into the ocean, you know, and goes on in to the, into the lake, and the others came, and then Peter went out and pulled the big fish up in the net. But Peter was very aggressive, but Peter was often self-willed, a little bit bigger, stronger, physically, more certain of himself, of his own strength, and it took him a while to get truly humbled. And here he was, and he says, I'll never turn aside. I will never be made to stumble. Verse 34, and Jesus said, As surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Boy, Jesus knew, of course, ahead of time. And Peter said, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Well, of course, you know what happened. Peter went on, or Jesus went on, and went out to the Gethsemane and began to pray. He said, you stay and pray, but they didn't. And so a little bit later, you find in verse 40, then he came to the disciples as after he'd been praying fervently to God for help and strength, because he realized even as the Christ, as God in the flesh, he could not make it on his own strength. He found them asleep and said, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we have to really understand that, brethren. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We've got to have God's spirit. And Peter did not have God's spirit yet, of course, and none of them did because the spirit was with them, as you know, but not yet in them. You read that in John, the 14th chapter, they had God's Spirit guiding and helping them in certain things, but it was not yet part of their very character because the Spirit was not poured out until after the day of Pentecost. So Peter was still weak. He made these proclamations, but he had a lot of problems. And he didn't pray. He didn't pray. He just thought, I'll just go on. And because he did not pray and he did not humble himself, he did not have the strength he should have had. Then you turn to, pay, to verse 69 here, in verse 69, and then it says after they had been spitting in Jesus' face and slapping him around after they came and got him, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant go, a girl came saying, you are with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it, saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gate where another girl, another servant girl came and said, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But verse 42, again he denied it with an oath. Apparently he cussed, took some kind of blank, 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 you know, and said, I don't know this guy. He was all scared then because he saw the Roman soldiers around with their spears. Now he was big, but he didn't have a spear and his whole group of trained men there ready to kill him. And after a while, those who stood by said, 
Surely you're one of them because your speech betrays you. They could say to me, you've got that, that Missouri, Southern Missouri, Lozark accent. You know, <laughs> Your speech betrays you. You don't have a good New England accent or whatever it is. Then he began to curse and swear. Think about this. The one who just a few weeks later became the leading apostles over the Jews began to curse and swear. I don't know the man, blank, 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 blank. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus who'd said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times what you just got through doing. And then he went out and wept bitterly. That strong man, prepped with big shoulders, was just shaking and crying, what a rat, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Haven't you ever felt that way? You're converted, and yet sometimes you may slip back and start smoking or cussing, or breaking God's Sabbath in a way, not just some little way, but a lot of ways, or you find yourself stealing God's tithe, and you make excuses not to save your second tithe, or you make excuses not to come to the Sabbath service when you know you could and should, or you don't trust God for healing in cases where you should, or whatever it is, you start compromising, and you feel like a rat. Peter felt like a rat. He went out and wept bitterly, and he didn't fully repent, of course, until perhaps later. And then the Holy Spirit came and helped him to fully understand what he ought to be doing. He fell short because he did not have God's Spirit and he did not pray as he should have done for the outside help. Turn back to Daniel, brethren, Daniel, the third chapter, if you would. Get some of this tea here. In Daniel 3, you read a very familiar passage, so I won't read every word. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as you know. And Nebuchadnezzar, brethren, and most of you realize this, was one of the most powerful, one of the most capable, too, frankly, and one of the greatest kings in human history. Tremendous natural ability when you read about what he did. And God calls his ink kingdom, by the way, one reason you know that, the head of gold because God recognized this was a wonderful, rich, powerful kingdom. But Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits, about 90 feet high, in the plain of Dura, and he had this vanity like many of these pagan emperors did. I'm so great, you remember how Adolf Hitler used to strut around and had them sig heil him, and some of you older brethren, as I have done, have seen the pictures of Mussolini and how he'd walk and strut around, and he got up on this balcony, and they'd scream and, and uh, salute him and, Vive il Duce! Vive il Duce! You know, just like they do the Pope. It says, now they say, Viva il Papa. <coughs> I better quit my screaming here. I'll get <laughs> ruin my throat. But that's what they were doing over and over. These pagan emperors wanted that. They wanted that human worship because they didn't put their fear and trust in God. So he had the people worship him, and if they didn't, well, they were going to be killed and put in a fiery furnace. And verse 6, whoever does not fall down and worship, he shall be cast immediately into the midst of the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar decreed. And therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forth. They apparently were the leaders among the Babylonians, sort of the priests and religious people, and they accused the Jews. Who do people usually accuse? Seems always the Jews. They're jealous. The Jews have always been extremely capable people. And brethren, I'm just saying this to you. I should say it when I'm preaching before a bigger crowd or on the radio but, or on television as we are now. But the Jews as a race, and they're really not a race, but an ethnic group, are the most capable people on the earth. And it's good for us to understand that. A lot of you perhaps haven't thought of it that way. I am not a Jew, by the way. I may be partly, I may not be mainly, but partly Levite. My mother's name was Kohen, or Cohen. The word Cohen in the Greek Hebrew language means priest, and certain indications behind that, but, but I'm not a Jew. The Judah, house of Judah, Judah means literally in the Hebrew language praise. And you look all over the earth, and even the Germans got so jealous because the Jews tended to get the money. They tended to be the best musicians. They tended to be this and that and something else. I don't know the latest. Perhaps Mrs. McNair does or some of our musicians, maybe Dylan King. But a few years ago, you started counting up the top musicians on the earth. 
And who were the top pianists on the whole face of the earth? Not rated by themselves, but by any music critic. You know, you had Rubenstein and you had uh, Benjamin, or you had uh, uh, the Horowitz, Vladimir Horowitz, and a lot of these Jews. Uh, and I don't know all their names now, but I did at one time. They were all Jews. Who were the top violinists on the face of the earth? And uh, again, uh, Fritz Chrysler and, uh, and uh, oh, I forget the names of all of them, but they were all Jews. Isaac Stern and uh, so on, Jewish names. And out of the top half dozen or so, they were all Jews, not one exception. And sometimes the top bankers and the top mathematical theorists. You look at the list, which I've done, and the L.A. Times published it years ago. They didn't say who was a Jew and who was not, but I looked at the list. And then I talked to some of my friends who know the, knew these people. And out of about 20 names, they mentioned as the top atomic and hydrogen scientists that at the very top of the field of physics and nuclear physics and that kind of thing. Of course, the top is Einstein, started the whole thing, who was the father of the H-bomb. Dr. Edward Teller, an English Jew, who was the father of the atomic bomb. Uh, uh, anyway, he was a Jew, too. <laughs> the name's Lee. I'm having a senior moment now. You just rattle these things <laughs> off. But uh, they, all, those names were about half or three-fourths were Jews. That must be about half or three-fourths of the people on earth are Jews, right? <laughs> no, only about one or two percent or maybe one half of one percent of all the people on the earth are Jews. They just have that kind of mind. Now, I don't have that kind of mind, and most of you don't either. And some of you are part Jewish, but I used to kid my Jewish students and fellow faculty members, remember, you Jews, God starts where? He starts at the bottom and works up. <laughs> I used to kid my friend Mordecai Joseph and, and uh, Mr. Nathan, who taught uh, Hebrew there at the college, and, and uh, Dr. Robert Kuhn and many others that I knew who were dear friends, uh, uh, Mike Levy, and uh, others, and uh, they, they understood I was kidding them. It's partly true, of course. God doesn't start out with the Einsteins and Bernsteins and all the others. He starts at the bottom and works up, and he didn't call the most brilliant, but they tend to be very brilliant. So they get to be accused because of jealousy. And since the Jews took the lead in accusing Christ, then perhaps God has allowed that, but nevertheless, that's what they always tended to do. And they said in verse 12, There are certain Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have, been paid, have not paid due regard to you. They do not worship your gods or worship the golden image which you set up. Boy, Nebuchadnezzar now, he was a big shot, and on occasion he was extremely magnanimous and extremely wise. But somehow this got to his pagan carnal nature. And then he, in rage and fury, gave command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and brought them. And he said, you will worship my God or else. And who is the God who will deliver me, uh, deliver you from my hands? Verse 16, they answered, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. You know, we're not scared of you or beholden to you. If that is the case, if we are thrown into the fiery furnace, our God whom we serve... Say they had profound trust in God. They were willing through the character they developed to give their lives in a burning, fiery furnace. He is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But, they said, if not, we can't be absolutely sure. We're not trusted. We're not putting God to the test here, saying he has to. But if not... Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you've set up. I don't think they said it in an arrogant way. They were very capable men who'd been used by Daniel in high offices in the province, but they said it firmly. And boy, they sent Nebuchadnezzar into the high dungeon, as we say. He was really all upset. And so his face changed, and he had them heat the furnace seven times hotter through the men, and you know what happened. They didn't burn. And as they looked into the furnace, somehow it was an open kind of a pit apparently. Then look, he answered in verse 25, there are four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. This fourth being was shining. Apparently an angel, it may literally have been Jesus Christ right there appearing in that way, encouraging Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the fiery furnace, a big, some kind of a pit, 
and yelled out, no doubt, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Oh, he figured that out now, didn't he? <laughs> servants of the Most High God. He felt humble for a change. Come here and come forth. And then they came out, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power, and the hair of their head was not sanded, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not even on them. And then Abraham, our main uh, Nebuchadnezzar, had got the picture, and he said, Blessed be the God of Abraham, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. That's the point, brethren. These men had absolute faith, and they had the character to put their lives on the line in a way that most of us perhaps would not do, even though we have God's Spirit. We better realize that. If that furnace were right there, and you were about to be thrown in, and you know you'd be screaming and just thrown in and burn, burn alive, what would you do? Is God that real to you? Do you have that kind of character? Well, that kind of test is going to come on many of God's people within the next 10 or 15 years. I'm just telling you that. I don't mean you're going to be thrown in a furnace, but there's going to be a great tribulation, and you're going to have the time to choose between being you know, shunned or put aside or literally killed or tortured or something, many of us. And we're going to have to have that kind of character and that kind of faith and trust in the Most High God and learn who the Most High God is. In Him we live and move and have our being. Our character is being tested every single day. Your character is being tested every single day. My character is being tested every single day. And I know that. Even though I have an office at this time, I could turn aside. It doesn't make any difference who we are. Satan's going to get after us. And sometimes he'll get after the leaders even more than the layman. If he could pick one of us off. If he could turn Dr. Winnale aside and get him bitter. If he could turn Mr. Ames aside and get him bitter, if he could turn me aside and get to me to be so vain or this or that, I would start saying, well, I'm this or that, I'm some great prophet or I'm the great palooka, you know, or whatever, and, and start yelling and turning things around. I'm so powerful I can change the doctrines. No. If God wants any of us to be an apostle later on, he will show that. I've had probably 30 to 90 people, more like 90, say, well, you, we know you're an apostle. Some were telling me that even in Branson. I said, no, I don't know that. And I, I do not know that at all. If God wants one of us to be an apostle, he will help the work grow even more powerfully, and he will perform unusual miracles, real miracles, instant healing, this and that, to show the fruits of an apostle. And he has not done that. And until that time, I'm an evangelist. Mr. Ames is an evangelist. Dr. Winnale is an evangelist. Mr. Party is an evangelist. And we are not apostles. And we do not appoint ourselves as apostles, as some mixed up guy up here has done. Or we do not appoint ourselves as some prophet. That is kind of ridiculous. But we've got to be humble servants of Christ. And recognize, yes, we've been given an office. I was ordained an evangelist on December 20th, 1952, when I was still kind of a kid, very, very young. I'm the youngest evangelist ever ordained in the worldwide church, as far as I know. But at any rate, Mr. Armstrong said later, some of you really didn't fit, but some of you grew into the office, and uh, some of us stayed on and did the work. But brethren, we need to have character, and character is the most important thing. Now turn to uh, the book of Proverbs at this point. I'd like to read it all. I encourage all of you, as I said at the feast in Myrtle Springs, to try to read this book more often and feed on the Bible these books these chapters and verses in Proverbs are principles of wisdom. What does a leader need? He needs character most of all, but as a tool to do his job, he needs wisdom to make right judgments and to decide the course of action or to decide this or decide that in dealing with people or situations or whatever. And one key verse or chapter is chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15 and if you just turn that, just read you a few scriptures, then I hope you'll all get your nose in the book of Proverbs and read it more often. Verse 3, Proverbs 15, verse 3, The eyes of the ever-living one are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. We are being tested every day of our lives, you and me and all of us. God is watching us. How well is Josh Beatty doing with what he's been given? 
How much is he growing? How much is Mr. Ruddleston growing and doing with what he's been given? How much is each one of you, not to pick on the rest of you, I know these two fairly well as friends, so I'm not implying there's something bad, I'm just hoping they won't get mad at me using them as examples. How much are you and you and you growing? How much do you do with what God has given you? That's the way God judges. His eyes are watching us every day, and we have to realize that. And let's go on here. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Remember, the, much of the book of James is devoted to that, particularly chapter 3. How do you control your tongue? But perverseness and it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives reproof is prudent. How well can you take criticism? Do you really take criticism, or do you always write, well, here's the way I look at it. Well, you made a mistake too, and blah, blah, blah. Or do you sit and try to learn and think, can I learn from this? Is God speaking through this other individual to help me? That's one of the key things about deep conversion that I have learned in 58 years in God's work. A person who will not take criticism is in trouble. You've got to be willing to take correction. A person who will not take correction will probably not be in God's kingdom. You've got to take it or you will not be there. That's part of God's character. He who receives reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous, there is much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked, there is trouble. So God blesses uh, the, the people who are serving him, but of course, not always physically. I have a little, a little something I write here in the book of Proverbs here, uh, back here in chapter uh, 14, verse 28. And the multitude of people is a king's honor. Oh, really? Well, that, those physical things were true back then, and we have to apply the principle. How many people did Jesus have after three years of his ministry? 120, not very many. So that's not always necessarily the truth. You know what I mean? God tells the church, not the huge church, the little flock. But certainly God will honor Christ and those who follow him eventually with huge numbers in time. And the same thing with this thing here. We're not always going to have great physical treasures. I wrote in the margin here, Jesus, question mark. <laughs> Jesus said the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So we'll have awesome treasure in the spiritual treasure in this life. And in the world to come, what will we have? The entire universe we will inherit along with others. But everything indicates the earth and perhaps even the universe. But the revenue of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. Do you do that or do you just talk about stupid stuff or negative stuff all the time? The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. That shows deep thought and character. But the heart of the fool does not do so. Verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the eternal. People who are saying, oh, I just give this and that and some big shots uh, in the world, give to their church, the Catholic church or Methodist church or whatever, but God does not bless them unless they really truly serve him. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. He will hear the prayer of the one who is truly serving him, the one who has character. If a person does not have character and they just give some great flowery prayer as you often hear on the radio if you hear some of these religious programs and they're often reading, if you follow them, I used to follow my Methodist ministers, they got to be a carnal teenager, sometimes I'd peek up and he was giving this long prayer and I could see his eyes, you know, the, the speaker stand up there, the podium had a light and his eyes were going back and forth and he was reading these great flowery prayers probably written by some Church of England bishop 300 years ago, <laughs> you know, it wasn't prayer from his heart at all, just great flowery, we're, oh God, we thank you, oh God, blah, 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 great big vocabulary and so on, he was reading this prayer. Well, that doesn't impress God. God wants us down on our knees, perhaps even with tears in our eyes, saying, Father, help me, clean me up, scrub me out, fashion me, mold me, make me like you are. And you really mean that. And then God will hear your prayer, the prayer of the upright. And the upright is the one who has character. So these are key things we learn from the book of Proverbs. Turn to chapter or to verse 14. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. What do you feed on? Do you feed on television? Television is primarily aimed to the 12 to 14 year old mentality. 
And I've read that quite a number of times, and that's what the Hollywood producers acknowledge. They are specifically gearing their programs to that kind of a early teenage mind, the 12 to 14-year-old mind. As you read, see those programs, you realize that. It's just stupid stuff, nothing very uplifting. It's better to, perhaps, if you watch the news, don't watch CNN all the time. They just hear about Paris Hilton and all what happened to her, or, or Britney Spears wants to show off her body and what happened to her, or, you know, what's his name, Michael Vick, and he was uh, torturing his dogs and what's going to happen to him. Well, so what? Here's one creep, you know, here and there, some entertainer. So what? They shouldn't even be given the time of day. Why are they on television? Why are they talking about them where there are literally hundreds of millions of people starving to death, being beaten, raped, mutilated, put down, dictators conquering and hurting people all through Asia, all through the Middle East, all through Africa, all through Central and South America. Big things are happening in the whole world. The Chinese are building up and building up and we're going down and down. And all they have to do is punch the button in the computer and take out hundreds of billions of dollars of our money and bring us to financial ruin in a matter of minutes. It won't take days and months and years anymore. These things are real. Does television tell you about these things? Practically never. Once in a long time, they'll hint at it. They just deal with this stupid stuff to interest a 12-year-old mind. But the heart of him who has understanding, if God has called you, then you ought to seek knowledge. Read the Bible, first of all. Read other books about the Bible. Read history. Read great biographies and autobiographies of great men and women, the lessons they've learned, the things that are uplifting and will help you be a better person, a more real, powerful, effective leader in tomorrow's world. So those are the things you ought to read and think about. Verse 22, without counsel, plans go awry. How many people just decide what they want, and then if they talk to anybody, they will just go to someone whom they already know agrees with them? That's not getting multitude of counsel. And God says a number of times, as he does here, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Get a number of counselors. I know we used to use the term in Ambassador College. After several years, we realized what the kids normally did, because a lot of them were new, and they were carnal. They weren't mature like most of you are. But they would do, we called it minister shopping or counselor shopping. You know what I mean? They would try to find the minister that they thought would agree with them. And then they go to that person to get their own way. Minister shopping. If they thought, if they, thought they had a problem and they knew I was strict, you know, against necking or against drinking too much or doing this, they wouldn't come to me. They would come to some guy who was more liberal. But if they wanted uh, something to... Well, another way, they'd come to me or they'd come to someone else. They'd minister shopping. They'd try to find the loose brick and get someone to halfway agree with them to get what they wanted anyway. So anyway, try to get the right kind of counsel from people that really know about the problem that you're concerned with and the multitude of counselors. If you're going to have character, be humble enough to make right decisions. Be humble enough to get a multitude of counsel. Learn to think. Learn to use your mind. Learn to be the right kind of leader because you're humble and close to God. Then God can use you through all, all eternity in a big job. So anyway, be humble. That's a tremendous part of character, to realize your own weakness and to love others, to have respect, and so on. So only by a people of character can the work of God really be done on this earth? And people who consistently govern their lives by God's laws because they will to do what is right and they use God's power to do what is right, they are the people who will be the kings and priests in tomorrow's world, men and women of genuine character. Turn to Ezekiel 28, again a familiar scripture, I'm not giving a lot of brand new shocking things, but these are basic things that I've given in various sermons in various ways, and I want you to learn from this though. Ezekiel chapter 28 at this point, brethren, and here you find the story of the one who became Satan the devil. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 12. And the son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. He's been describing the prince of Tyre, who was wiser than Daniel, if you read the early verses, and was a human leader of Tyre, now he jumps up to who? Now he goes above the prince of Tyre, who had all this power, 
to the power behind the throne, you could call him, Satan the devil himself, who was the real leader of this great pagan city and the real leader of the pagan Babylonian empire and the real God of this world, as Jesus called him. He said, thus says the eternal God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Is that the most important thing? No. The most important thing is surrender character to your creator. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So he's not talking about a human being. He's talking about the one who was in Eden who fell away. You know, Satan the devil. Every precious stone was your covering. He had apparently kind of a throne and, and honor in that way with great uh, beautiful uh, pearls and onyx and things around, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes indicating music. Satan has great music, by the way. And I love great music, and we've had good music here today, and we've had good music elsewhere. God's not against that, but Satan uses beautiful women to lead men astray. He uses beautiful music to lead people astray. You know how the Catholic Church will have massive choirs and big processions and stuff. It's just beautiful. You go down to St. Peter's, and you see it, a, a building that makes most of the other churches of the world look like an outhouse. Sorry to use that term, but that's what it does. If you've seen St. Peter's, I've seen it several times. It's just magnificent. Just magnificent. Satan is very good at that. But he doesn't have character. He has those things instead. You were anointed, the anointed cherub. So he was a cherub, a super archangel who covers... In other words, he was one of those who was set over God's throne. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God, the kingdom of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways. You see, at the beginning, Satan was perfect. Tremendous mental power, capacity, beauty, everything. In the day, you were what? Created, a created being, a super archangel called a cherub, in the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. That's when he turned aside. Why? Because he began to feel, he began to feel his own, own oats. As we say, sometimes a man gets so important, he's all full of himself. And once you get full of yourself, boy, I'm big and I'm important and I'm powerful, then he begins to what? It simply ruins him. He becomes his own God and he cannot humble himself fully before the true God, the God of the universe. That was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. He had all that power. He had men servants and women servants, probably a whole bunch of beautiful concubines and beautiful musicians and beautiful palaces and beautiful everything. He turned aside because he had all this power. So Satan turned aside. By the abundance of your trading, and as I look at it, I haven't studied it exhaustively, but in talking to one scholar, he agreed it could mean politicking, your activities, your trading, what you're doing, I think part of that involved politicking because Satan was going around trying to politic and do deals with the various angels. Well, if you did and come death with me, then I'll, and he got one-third of his angels, one-third of the angels, I mean, to come with him, as is indicated, as you know, in Revelation chapter 12. One-third of the angels followed Satan in this rebellion because he began to have these wheeling and dealing activities and trading and promises you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain, or the kingdom of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. He finally cast him out because he was too filled with himself, and he was not totally surrendered to the true God, the God of the Bible. Turn back to chapter 14 of Isaiah, a companion chapter, as most of you know. Isaiah chapter 14. And let's begin reading in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Remember his name was originally Lucifer. Luce, as you know, is in the Latin and the Greek means light. Light. He was a light bringer. Shining star of the dawn, it's sometimes translated. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? See, he became the God of this age. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'm just as good as you are. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He began to feel 
he was, he got, he was filled with himself. That's what it amounted to. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. God apparently is in the north as from this point of view of the earth. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's the key. He tried to be like the most high right now, you know, his way. Where God promises us, of course, elsewhere, if we humble ourselves, if we completely surrender to God and let him fashion and mold us and put his spirit indeed in us, indeed we will be like the most high. The devil has a counterfeit way. He wanted to just promote himself that way and get it right now on his terms. God said, no way, because Satan was going to be, as he began to be called, not the light bringer, but God changed his name to Satan, which means adversary or the enemy. Worship God. Honor those who serve God, though, and don't try to overthrow them. If God has put me here as a human instrument, not because I'm great, I'm not, not because I'm the smartest, I'm not, not because I'm better looking, I'm certainly not that, but because I've had the training for 58 years under Mr. Herbert Armstrong and at least of all the headquarters evangelists of the early years, I've been faithful to the truth and have been willing to carry that on. You can honor the fruits and what God is doing. And if I turn aside, you keep worshiping God and don't follow me. Follow God, follow Christ if I turn aside. But if I don't turn aside and I continue to do the work, get the message out with all my heart over the whole world as best I can at my, with my human strength and teach the truth, then follow me as I follow Christ. That's all I ask. But some men, as you know, back at the time of the Larry Salyer, uh, Norbert Link, Edwin Pope Rebellion back in 1998, they were saying, and I had several people tell me from the Oregon Feast site where one of these guys was saying, well, Mr. Meredith is dying of cancer and he's having mental lapses and forgetting things and so on. They were telling people that even back there, and I had several tell me that. And uh, he said he has cancer. Well, because I told some of my close associates, and I thought they were close associates and were loyal at that time, I said, well, I've got these little things on my skin and little tiny growths. And the doctor, you know, the, uh, will sometimes put this ice stuff, whatever it is, and freeze it, and it'll come right off. It's not cancer inside your body. President uh, uh, Bush Sr. has had those for years. He's still living, clear up in his mid-80s. But they use that to say I had cancer and I was dying with cancer. And now I've told some people I have this, I'm tired, or after a sermon, or this or that. Then they try to spread the rumor, well, Mr. Meredith's dying. Well, I might die tomorrow, but on the other hand, I take after my mother, and she lived to be 94. Watch out. I might live 17 more years. <laughs> so don't, don't conduct my funeral too soon. You might be in trouble. You might be in trouble. Try to get the right picture, the right balance. Don't follow some guy who tries to rise up and overthrow one who is faithfully serving him. And I can honestly say I never even started to commence to do that. I did not before God, ever, 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 in any way, even in my mind. But anyway, Satan did, and that's what caused God to throw him out. I will be like the Most High, he said. I'll, I'm as good as you are. I'll take over. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit, and showed how he was going to be brought way down, which he was. Of course, it doesn't say he would die in the sense he comes back down to the human type as he describes this. But Satan will be brought down and put finally in the bottomless pit and the lowest depths of the pit, but not live on perhaps in certain torment as a spirit being who has been completely cut off from everything and every power forever at that point in time because he did not have the right character. What did he have? Was he smart? He was smarter than all of us put together, brethren. I really mean that. I think if you can figure things out, you, you can realize that. All of us know certain things, but the devil knew all kinds of things. All of us, if we got together and tried to figure it out, we wouldn't know those things. He was a spirit being. He had power. He could go shooting up to the stars and do this and that. Physical power, absolute beautiful beauty, great impressive appearance, powerful, wonderful music, soaring music, and fantastic abilities in many ways beyond all of us put together. And it went to his head. But he did not have humility. Humility is so important. He did not have God's character. And that's the thing we all have to understand. 
and to learn from, to have that humility and that deep fear of God. So that is very important, and character is vital. What is Satan's fate? You want to follow that example and be all full of yourself and turn aside? Where do you want to spend eternity? Satan is going to spend eternity in the bottomless pit. He can't do anything. He'll be frustrated forever. We would not actually are blessed in that way. We won't have to be living in frustration, but we will be burned up. We will be ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous, as you know it tells us back in Malachi, if we knowingly, willfully sin and turn away from God. So be sure that you fear God, not as a monster, but have the awe of God so you don't want to do that and you really want with your heart to have holy, righteous character and fulfill the purpose for which God created you, the purpose for which God called you, the purpose for which God has blessed you, if he has indeed called you and given you his spirit. Fear God in that way. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 4 in your New Testament now. Again, Hebrews chapter 4. And we'll begin in verse 14. He's talking about Jesus Christ here. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Don't give up and quit. Hold fast. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. God is not way up there and say, I don't understand how someone could get weak and maybe, you know, cuss a little or smoke a little or have some human weakness after he's converted. Thousands have had that, and you have had it, and I've had it. We've all gone back and done certain little things that are not right. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. He went through the same human trials, in effect, you know, not every temptation exactly the way we've had it, but he had, well, you know, back then he was a young man and he had to live in the human flesh without a wife for 33 and a half years. And I want to tell you, I'm sure the women back there were absolutely beautiful. The women today have to fix up and fix up and often put on makeup and do this, but the women back there, the wheat germ was in the wheat back then <laughs> and the women in Palestine were out in the sunshine and they're walking and walking had beautiful figures beyond what we have today and they must have been gorgeous and Jesus would look at one and have a pull but he didn't start turning it in his mind he thought no I've created these women I am God in the flesh and I'm going to go on he was spiritually married to the church so he did not let his mind entertain even entertain the idea of sex with a woman. That wouldn't have been wrong if he would wanted to marry one, but he knew he could not, so he didn't even entertain sin in his mind. He was in, in all points tempted. Why did he feel like at times when those men grabbed him after his first sermon and they were going to throw him down off the cliff, you know, and he was landing on the hard rocks before? Well, I'm sure there was a momentary thought, well, I'll knock a few heads together here, you know, and, and take care of himself. He was very strong physically. I'm sure he was. He wasn't some weak guy. And you read a lot about him, and you see that. He was the one who said, whatever you do, do with your might. And he had been a carpenter and stone builder using heavy stones and timbers. He was probably powerfully built. And that was his very first sermon. He still had the strength from his years of carpentry. And he must have had the feeling, I'll take care of myself. No, God will take care of me. And so God confused them, and apparently he walked through their midst some way, and he just went on. He didn't run like a scared rabbit, but God got him out of everything like that. But he was tempted. Let us, therefore, he understands us. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. God wants us to come right to him through Jesus Christ, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God will hear us, and God will bless us, but we need to have faith and come boldly. And then he described down here in chapter 6, uh, in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 6, I'm sorry, as he also prays or says in another place, that is the person writing the Psalms, King David, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. A psalm, Psalm 110, describing the coming Christ, who in the days of his flesh, the days Christ was with us here on this earth in the human flesh, tempted in all points like as we are, in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications, meaning repeated heartfelt prayers, with vehement cries and tears, 
Brethren, his shoulders were shaking. Perhaps his voice was shaking. Tears were streaming down his face, and he was literally crying out, Father, Father, help me. There isn't anyone else to be the Savior of the world, and Satan is after me, and these are guys are after me trying to kill me, and I have these human temptations. Please help me. I've got to make it. And I'm sure he prayed prayers like that. It says in this word right here, he cried out with vehement cries and tears to him that was able to save him from death. He wasn't just saying, you know, blah, 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 blah. He was crying with his whole being and literally crying with tears streaming down his face and was heard because of his godly fear. The deep awe he had for God, knowing the glory that was ahead, knowing his purpose. Though he was a son, yet even Jesus learned obedience by what? By the things he suffered we learn obedience by the things we suffer. I've had to suffer many things over many years, even in the work. And I've told you some of them being sent away here and there, sometimes when I should not have been, frankly, sometimes maybe I should have been not being sent away, but other times I was corrected. But you just have to wait on God and say, God will take care of it. Other times I was corrected and learned by the suffering because I'd done something bad or to been careless with my own body and God allowed some horrible thing to come on me. I knew I had a sinus trouble. I knew I shouldn't eat a lot of ice cream. I'd known that for years, maybe decades. And finally at age 29, one time I literally gorged myself, ate way too much ice cream, got this horrible, which I loved ice cream, still do by the way, I got this horrible sinus headache. And instead of being careless, if my wife had been there, she'd have yelled at me and told me to stop blowing my nose so hard. My mother used to tell me, that I thought, I've got to get rid of this and blow and blow. And it blew this stuff up in my middle ear. And I got a middle ear infection. And it was the most pain I've ever had. I've had many horrible toothaches. But this was even worse, right inside your head, inside your brain almost. It was horrible. I lost about 30 pounds from 148 down to 118. I was like a skeleton. I could show you a picture of me at my uncle, Dr. C. Paul Meredith's wedding, like a refugee from Dachau. And God allowed me to be very, very humble for a while for my good, for my good. And he's taught me lessons many years through suffering. He'll teach you lessons through human suffering and your human body. Sometimes he allows terrible things to come on you to wake you up, to help you get it. When you finally get it and begin to cry out to him, then he will help you and deliver you. God rebukes and chastens every son he loves. Jesus, the Son of God, learned by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Yes, we don't just believe in Jesus, like these preachers say. We must obey God, obey God, and do what God says and develop his very character. James 1 tells us certain things about character that we also need to learn. Very importantly, James chapter 1 and beginning in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he's been proved. So you go through this fiery test, this fiery trial. He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. Does God put some thought in your mind to beat up on someone or kill someone? No. Does he put in your mind, does he literally try to project thoughts in your mind to commit adultery or fornication? No. Don't say I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. Is God tempted by Britney Spears or all these beautiful young girls in Hollywood? Of course not. Here he is up in the heavens. He made the female body. He designed every aspect of it. He looks down on these creatures that he made. He doesn't have any sex drive in the sense of a human young man. He's able to look at them totally objectively. He just sees this young woman filled with vanity and sees these old men who often take advantage of these young women and get them to use their bodies or minds or talents to make more money for these middle-aged men, guide them into that. And these women are foolish and childlike. Let that happen. So he, fun, he knows that part of it too. God is not tempted by any of that stuff. He doesn't tempt anyone else either. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed your own human nature. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. You see, you let your mind entertain 
Brethren, that's another aspect of character. Don't entertain. If you start getting bugged by someone and you don't like them, if you keep rolling it around and rolling it around and rolling it around, it gets worse and worse. Well, so-and-so's done me wrong. Well, boy, they really done me wrong. Oh, boy, it's awful, 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 and pretty soon you almost hate them. You keep rolling it around on your head. That can be the spirit of murder after a while. Don't do that. You can get you young men, uh, you, some pretty girl in your mind, and you roll it around, roll it around, and you can picture yourself kissing, caressing her, and so forth, and it gets worse and worse. Don't do that. You don't roll it around in your mind. He's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. You see, you let that desire keep going around in your head, and sin, when it is full of wrong, what is it? Is it going to give you great pleasure? No, it brings death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin, the ultimate reward of sin is death and will ultimately be the second death, of course, in the lake of fire unless it's really repented of. And God gives us many chances to repent, of course. For do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Think of God, the giver of every wonderful gift, who made the beautiful earth, the vast universe, the soaring mountains, the beautiful valleys. Yes, beautiful young women, handsome young men, gorgeous music, soaring majesty of all kinds of things made by God. Every wonderful thing comes from God. And every good and every perfect thing you see in any other human is only there because God put it there. And he has a lot more where that, thing, where that comes from. Every good thing comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He didn't have any variation. He's not good one day and bad the next. He doesn't suddenly lose his temper. He is constant, consistent. You can rely on God because he has the ultimate character of righteousness. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He put his word in us, and we know the truth. And he guides us then that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Really try to listen. Try to understand. Say, God, help me understand. Help me get it. Help me be your son. Be swift to hear, slow to speak. Well, here's the way I look at it. No, don't think that way. If you're being taught by a servant of God, you say, well, the servant of God isn't always perfect. Well, that's true. Mr. Armstrong was not always perfect. I'm not always perfect. None of us are perfect. But if it's come God and you sense that and are willing to understand that, you'd better think it's from God if a man is in office and prove it at least in a positive way, not a negative way. As the Bereans did, they proved whether these things were so. As they were listening to Paul, they were not listening to try to find it was not so. You see what I mean? They didn't approach it negatively. Well, if I find one mistake, I'm going to not follow this guy because I'm all suspicious. I've been disillusioned. Mr. Armstrong made mistakes, and then after he left, the conscious tore things up, so I can't trust the ministry anymore, and I'm going to go around being suspicious all the time. No, that can't help you. We can't help you if you have that attitude. Prove it in a positive way. Prove it nevertheless, but have a right attitude. So let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Don't get upset quickly, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside, put clear away from your mind and heart all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Don't feed on television. Don't feed on this stuff on the Internet and just pour that garbage into your brain. And receive with meekness the implanted word, God's holy word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers. Don't just listen and say, well, I agree with that. Okay, that's fine, you agree. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Do it. That's where character comes in. So these things are so important. We must be like this. We can only hope for the kingdom of God or the promises because of God's unswerving character. He does not turn aside. There's no variation in the way he is. So we must understand that and trust him and put our faith and trust in him and be like him and never compromise, never knowingly compromise. Try to hold yourself to a higher standard to beseech God to help you attain that standard. Back in Hebrews chapter 12 now, Hebrews, going back to that book again, turn to verse 1. He's writing here, as you know, brethren, to the older brethren, the headquarters church that had been there a long time, many of them, 
for the church of God started out at Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, as he'd just been describing, the, the pillars of the faith in chapter 11, the faith chapter, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You just slip up so quickly. You work and pray, and I can get up and pray and try to have a good attitude and leave the house, and someone cuts right in front of me and almost hits my fender coming into work on the freeway. I think, we'll get out of my oh, no, no, I better not be that way. You know what I mean? This human nature comes up so quickly. You've got to fight it and to walk with God, the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He went through it the same way we have to. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He kept his mind on the big picture. The ultimate goal that we are made in God's image to become full sons of God someday. And despising the shame sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Where he is right now as our living head and our high priest. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners, lest you become discouraged and weary. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, and brethren, very few of us have. Maybe none of us have had to resist to where we've actually been killed or tortured. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you've forgotten the exhortations which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Every single son that God is dealing with, and you ladies the same way, will all be spiritual sons someday in God's family. He will rebuke and chasten us along the way. He will shake us up. Sometimes he will shake us till our teeth rattle, and we will finally get the point. God is letting this happen to me for my good. Sometimes God has to bring something really strong on me because I have a fairly strong will or I wouldn't do the things I have done. But God has to really shake me and then I say, boy, God is getting a message to my brain. I'd better listen. <laughs> I'd better listen. And I hope all of you will learn from that and try to listen. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. You see, so endure chastening. Try to learn from it. And then later we find that our human fathers chastened us for our, uh, as best seemed best to them, but verse 10, but God for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. God does it to build our character that we might build that kind of character to be partakers of his holiness. He says in verse 18, and I gave this down in Myrtle Beach, but I want to repeat this passage. It's been something on my mind of late more than ever. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest. We're not coming to the great big mountain over there in Saudi Arabia or in the peninsula there, Mount Sinai. I climbed that mountain in 90 degree heat, big hill, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. That powerful voice almost blasted their eardrums for they could not endure what was commanded. One of the things was, it, if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned or thrust through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. And you know the bravery Moses had, how he had to lead Israel, and they tried to stone him again and again, and how he had to go right into Pharaoh's court, this great, powerful, super monarch who had his head chopped off right then, and say, let my people go. You better believe Moses was not a scaredy cat. But he was scared this time. The whole mountain shook. Lightning and thunder and fire came down and so forth. I'm afraid and trembling. But you, and God is speaking to us here too, you have come to Mount Zion, you see, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. We're going to join those people who have their names written in the book of life down through time to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Ruth, Moses, David, Peter, James, and John, and the Apostle Paul, all those men and women, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. There is a spirit in man. 
We don't, are not an immortal soul, but we have a human spirit, a spirit essence with our human brain that gives us creative imagination. It gives us the ability to choose the right and resist the wrong and to understand the difference between right and wrong. Animals are not embarrassed if they go to the bathroom, as we say, right out in public. It doesn't make any difference to them. They don't have that kind of understanding. They don't have that kind of sensitivity. They're not bad or good one way or the other. They are guided by instinct. Human beings alone are given the kind of mind that God is, gives, has to really understand spiritual concepts and creative imagination. And we must use that the right way. The spirits of just men made perfect. Abraham had to leave everything he'd ever known and go out to a land he'd never been to before and trust in the God of Israel. The spirit being who spoke to him, he did that and became the father of the faithful. Isaac had to follow his father's example. Jacob had to literally wrestle, get right in the dirt and strive against this being who later became Jesus Christ with all of his being. Moses had to go in as a very weak human being almost embarrassed to even speak out, said, I can't speak. And so God says, well, I'll give you your brother Aaron, and he'll be your spokesman. But he said, let my people go and to face this big emperor who could have him executed on the spot, over and over, putting his life on the line. Later on, King David had to flee for 10 years from Saul and hide out in the caves and hills of Judea. Oh, God of Israel, help me, deliver me. Those who are after me are stronger than I. You know the Psalms. He cried out again and again to God trusted in God, worshiped God, adored God, but who put his faith and trust in the God of creation and walked with that God. His spirit, his attitude was perfected gradually, made right. Peter, James, and John. Peter had that horrible incident near the end of his very ministry under Christ or with Christ in the flesh. What happened? The Holy Spirit came. He gets up and preaches to these people who had killed him, frankly. Repent, every one of you. And he told them that. And a few weeks later, Peter's shadow, Acts 15, verse 5. No, I'm sorry, Acts 5, verse 15. <laughs> Peter's shadow passing over people healed them. He was so close to God, walking with God, doing things where he knew he could have been killed and was threatened to be killed a number of times. James, his friend, was killed, had his head chopped off. Stephen, the first evangelist, had his head chopped off or was stoned to death by the members of the Sanhedrin. And Paul said, I cast my vote that they would kill him. And Paul repented and horribly repented and cried out to God, fasted three days and three nights with nothing when it was struck down. Acts 9, verse 9. These men and women have God have had their spirits, their attitude, their character made perfect. We're going to walk with them, talk with them, share with them, create with them, perhaps even other civilizations, and interact with God as our Father, Jesus Christ as our elder brother, and literally share with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Samuel, and outstanding women like Sarah and Ruth and the other great women of God throughout all eternity as spirit beings because we, if we can learn to develop the character of God and humble ourselves, genuinely humble ourselves and seek first God's kingdom way above everything else, that we can make it and have God and allow God and try and cry out to God to put within us the very character of God so we can be in his kingdom and be in his family and interact with the spirits of just men made perfect.